thanks so much for showing up to the Lead Gen Underground today, guys. Today, I have my friend Clay Rockwood, who is out in Salt Lake City, run, runs a very successful business, and today he's actually away on spring break with his family. So, Clay, can you give everyone just a, a brief intro of who you are and what you guys do? Definitely, yeah. So, yeah, like Josh said, I was born and raised in Salt Lake City. That's where I currently live. I've got five kids, a wife, so busy guy. Um, started in real estate um, back in 2008, right when the market was crashing, got my real estate license, thought I was, you know, I'd be an awesome real estate agent. Turns out I wasn't. <laughs> I did. I did okay. But I, I guess what I mean by that is I thought becoming a realtor, I'd, I would gain a lot of freedom. I'm like, hey, I'm going to be on my own boss. I can make my own hours, all this stuff. Oh, what's up, Stinson? I haven't seen him for a minute. <laughs> and anyway, um, yeah, so, and I, I soon realized, you know, after doing it for a couple of years that I was really still a slave to my clients, right? I was showing homes nights and weekends. As we had more kids, it was just becoming more of a, of a hassle than, than really anything. And so I was like, you know, I want to do something else. So I started looking into flipping homes. So my brother is a contractor. My dad is an architect. And we thought, hey, we'd make this kind of power team, you know, family thing where we'd go out and flip homes, which, uh, so we started that back in like 2011, roughly started flipping homes here and there and kind of growing that business. But again, I, I soon found that that was even a very transactional business because again, I was relying mostly on wholesalers or real other real estate agents to bring us deals. And when that wasn't happening, we didn't have any deal flow. Right. So up until that point, I'd never really done any more marketing of my own. I'd never gone out and sourced my own deals aside from stuff just on the MLS. And again, I was kind of getting frustrated because as the market was heating up in 2015, 2016, it was like harder and harder to find deals. I mean, everyone knows, especially nowadays, like how hard it is to find deals. And so I thought, you know what, I want to go out and find my own deals. I want to source my own stuff. And so I originally looked into wholesaling just as a means to, to find more flips, right? And that, that's really where it started. Um, I signed up for for a course, uh, I think it was Wholesaling Inc. where I first signed up. And actually through a, one of the seminars they held, I met my current business partner, Brian Martineau. We just like sat down for lunch one day, happened to just sit next to each other at the seminar. and was like, hey, let's do this together. Like we're both kind of getting into it. So that was back in 2017 that we decided to partner up. And it was then that we really got aggressive in starting to do our own marketing you know, started dialing things in, learning. I mean, we're still learning and adapting and growing, but that was kind of when we started building our team. And the interesting thing is we, from day one, we had the goal of being able to step away from our business. Because like I said, uh, for the last, I mean, seven or eight years, I tried to, you know, I was trying to be an entrepreneur running my own business, but really I was just, I was a one man show running around with my head cut off, like trying yep. to just survive. Yep. And I realized like, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to actually have a business that I can walk away. I can be on vacation and it will still bring deals. Like, and I'd never had that. So that was the goal from day one. And we realized like, in order to do that, it's going to require us to like push ourselves to get out of our comfort zone, to hire, to have big overhead potentially. You know, I mean, that's scary. I think that's where a lot of people kind of stop is that they're like, whoa, I'm going to like hire someone like payroll. Holy crap. That's crazy. You know, like yeah. for a lot of people, that's just, that's the huge step for them. So, but it was, and it was for us, it was definitely hard, but you just take it one day at a time and one step at a time. And now, yeah, we're at a, a place where we have a, a full team. Our, our wholesaling business is pretty much automated. Um, and, you know, our, our goal is to, to buy a lot of rentals. So like I said, that's kind of what I'm over now is just asset management and buying, you know, growing our portfolio of rentals. Um, and yeah, that's kind of where we're at today. So we, we're currently doing about, you know, just roughly averages about 200,000 a month in revenue in our wholesaling business um, and then slowly adding, adding to our rental portfolio as well. Oh, I love it. Okay, fantastic. So you gave me a few things there to talk about. But one, um, talk about the size of your portfolio, because I know you said it the other day, and it's not bragging or anything, but just give everyone an idea of, you know, what you guys are dealing with. Yeah, it's definitely not, it's not big. So I'm, I don't mind sharing it. At, so we're currently at 120 doors. We're actually under, con we're actually under contract on us. We're buying a 70 unit out in Ohio right now. Um, we're buying a couple of commercial properties next month. It'll add a, probably another 20 doors to our portfolio. So yeah, I mean, just 
our, our goal is to get to 5,000 doors in the next five years. That's Dude, that's amazing right there. That's something ahead. to do for. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, so you've been in the business roughly for about a decade now. Um, and you've, I can already tell you've gone through some of these phases where, you know, at the very beginning, you're buying from wholesalers and then starting your marketing, then partnering up and now really pulling yourself out of the business just a little bit, right? To work on, to focus on the pieces that you've gone through. So I think it's really cool um, that you have really been in probably five different roles at this point um, in your own company. Um, and you've had the foresight to know, um, I have to get to this to be able to do this next thing. Um, and you had said something too. You said, you know, we're still learning. Uh, to me, that's a, a great sign. Because if anyone says, when I learned or I'm not learning anymore, you're going to be dead in the water, right? You yeah. know, as well as I do, that this business adapts and changes so much. And it's the people that are always learning are the ones that are really great at it because you're not going to stop. It's not like a when I get there kind of thing. It's your, I'm always going to be learning. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, so definitely. Grateful when you said that. That's good. Okay. So Salt Lake City is a, a very, very competitive market as I understand it, right? Talk about today um, kind of, well, first talk about the marketing channels you started in and then talk a little bit about what's working today for you guys in terms of lead generation and marketing. Great, yeah. So we, uh, when we first started, I mean, we started probably where a lot of people do start. We did just direct mail um, and cold calling. And then we started adding in, you know, text blasting, ringless voicemails. And we even got into like, you know, TV commercials, radio, wow. you know, bus advertisements. Like we still have buses driving around the city with our name on it. It's so, so stupid. <laughs> but, um, and I always say that because I think that was one thing we learned is that like, we got arrogant and thinking like, well, everything will work. Let's just, let's just spend all this money and put all this, these marketing dollars out there. And we realized like, that was stupid. Um, first of all, half of that didn't work or the ROI was super low and, so really it's come back to, we've scaled it back now to like the fundamentals of, I mean, our, our top three producing consistently for the last five years has always been direct mail, pay-per-click and cold calling. Like I would say those three are just consistent. They always work. They always give a good return, at least in our market. And so, you know, again, we dabbled with other things. Text, text blasting was, was good until they kind of started changing some of the regulations, at least here for us, it did kind of slow down. But yeah, those are our main three. Like it, it's not rocket science. It's just consistency. Absolutely. Yeah, guys, this is what I've, for you guys listening out there, this is a point that I've heard from a lot of high performers in which Clay is one. Um, and I think when you're in this business, specifically wholesaling or specifically um, finding your own deals, right? You don't, the exit strategy doesn't even matter. But when you're trying to find your own deals, I myself have seen a pattern in these high performers where it's once they get to three or more channels that are, that they're almost an expert at, right? They've done them for a while. They're not dabbling. They're doing it consistently, but consistently at a high level. Once they get to these three channels or more, but particularly when you hit around that three mark is when they start to see the revenue go to the heights that they want it to, you know, six figures or even well into the six figures at 200 plus like you guys are doing. So I've had just a lot of lead generation questions like where should I start and what should I do? And my advice is always simple, like get really good at one and then yeah. outsource it or get a, build a team around it that can do it. Move on to the second, do the same thing, scale that up, become an expert at it and then build a team around it, move on to the third. Um, so it's really cool that you guys are seeing such results from all three of those. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you guys are doing a lot of wholesaling, and I believe you also told me before that you're doing some creative finance, if that's right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we were very careful to add. So again, with our team, we're very careful to, again, like you said, make sure our team is expert at one thing before we, we add more and more, right? That's the temptation is to like, oh, well, we can do this. It's, it's the classic shiny object syndrome, right? Where there's just so many niches you can get into and you can almost dilute yourself so much that you're not really doing much of anything very well. So um, once our team had been hired and like all of our acquisition managers, our disposition team, once everyone was dialed in with, you know, again, we we're just primarily doing cash offers. We're only buying cash, we're wholesalers, that's it. Once they're dialed in there and our business was producing well, we said, okay, now we're gonna add in seller finance, right? And again, what we did is we literally, we signed up for Pace Morby's Seller finance, like I'm a good friend of Pace's, right? So we signed up for his program. So every week we do a weekly training 
with pace on paces program of how to structure subject to seller finance. So now I would say maybe oh, 50 percent of our deals are all subject to or seller finance deals. Wow, that's really yeah. so subject to yeah. industry owner finance. Yeah, owner finance or, you know, there's obviously different ways you can structure uh, creative finance. Um, but yeah, like I would say now our team is pretty, pretty expert, like you said, at, at structuring these deals, knowing how to like analyze it, say, okay, is a cash offer the best thing for the seller or would it be a, a creative finance, you know, term? So we really just opened up the tool belt to be able to just structure more deals that otherwise we'd be turning away or throwing away if, if we were just looking at it through the lens of just a cash buy. Absolutely. Okay, cool. So I'm really curious here. I know you've talked a lot about your team before, at least when we talked before, you were talking about team. And this is a piece that um, really intrigued me because you were talking about the culture. And I was like, wow, these guys got it going on with their culture, right? And you talked to me about some of the rewards and things like the ways you incentivize the guys. But A, can you talk about your team, like how it's set up, how many people? And then talk about some important cultural things, because guys, this is something I'm working on myself right now with a very small team. Something that's really hard to nail, to get the right people and to keep them around and to make sure they're trained and working in the best manner for you. So can you talk a yeah. little bit about the way your team is set up now and like how many, what positions, and then start to talk about culture a little bit and the important things to you guys in your company and culture. Yeah, it's, it's interesting you ask that because we're, <laughs> we actually just went through a big transition in our team where we lost like four employees just barely like in the last two weeks so it's an interesting timing but basically we have uh, or we just had our, our COO just left us actually Peter who you, you guys I think have known but yeah so he left so basically we have a so me and Brian business partners in the company we had a COO uh, position which kind of ran the whole operation um, and then we really only have two acquisition guys right? So they're the ones that are just taking all the leads. Uh, previously, we had a lead intake manager that was kind of funneling all the leads through that person. But we actually found, at least for us, that that wasn't really necessary. It's kind of one of those positions that was, it was nice to have, but not necessary, right? It was kind of a payroll we were just paying. And so this is a lesson that I kind of want to tie into this is that there's, there's a benefit and a cost to a big team. And you have to find that balance because we were finding that our overhead was so high because we were having, we had all, you know, we had two assistants, we had this lead intake manager. We're like, we could literally have a VA do most of what they do, right? It's nice to have because it does create that culture and people are in the office, it's fun. But at the same time as business owners, you really have to analyze it and say, is this the best thing for the business? Is this gonna help us grow, right? So anyway, so, um, so we, we got rid of our lead intake manager. So now we just have two acquisition managers. We have a full-time disposition manager, a guy that just helps us sell all of our deals on the back end. We have a team of virtual assistants, obviously, um, that have been with us from the beginning. There's like four or five dedicated virtual assistants that help us run the whole business. Um, and then we have a team of cold callers. Uh, we, again, we outsource all that. It's nothing in-house, it's in Costa Rica. Um, the team of two or three different cold callers that work for us. Um, and then we have a full-time office assistant that just kind of helps the executive assistant that helps us with everything, but that's really it. It's not huge, but we found that that's kind of the sweet spot. Like, Oh, sorry. We, we do have more. We do have a, uh, a couple full-time, uh, what we call relationship managers. Yeah. And basically what they're, they're just out trying to hustle in our local market, networking with realtors, uh, putting on events just to kind of have people bring us more deals, JV partnerships, all that kind of stuff. So we do have that. Uh, but yeah, that's our, that's our core. It's, it's a small team, but um, I think we've found a sweet spot, like I said, where our, our production is, is optimal and our overhead is relatively low with our, our team. So it kind of works out. Got it. Yeah. That's really interesting that you say that about finding that sweet spot. Something I've spent a lot of time thinking about, experimenting with as I bring on people here and then have let some go, unfortunately, um, is where um, you know your expenses and your revenue hit that sweet spot for you in terms of production even. What are, I know obviously revenue and deals, but when you're talking about that sweet spot, what other kind of numbers are you looking at or what other kind of measurements are you even looking at that may not be necessarily um, just numerical, like we had talked about some cultural things before, but how, how do you know when you've hit that sweet spot or how do you know when you're starting to look to hire again? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think you kind of, well, we found that you just kind of know it, right? Or if you're like, um, hey, this is something like, for example, we just had the, we just recently hired the relationship managers. And that was a role we didn't have prior. But we, we, we saw that there was just kind of this, um, this lack in our business, like, hey, we have everything else dialed in with the marketing, um, with the dispositions, this is great. But we also saw that like people were just kind of bringing us deals randomly. Like, Hey, you guys are, know what you're doing. Like, you want to help me sell this deal I just found. And then we kind of sat back and we're like, huh, maybe we could capitalize on that. Like maybe we could be the experts in our market to where everyone who had a deal they wanted to, to sell, whether that's a wholesale or even a, a partially done flip. Like if they just want to get out of it, like we can sell that. So we're like, we should hire someone to, to, to control all that and to bring us more business that way. So I don't know. It, it, for us, it's always just been, we just kind of see a need, right? There's always just a, a hole there that's like, we can fill that. Or like I said, we've, like, a, just like you said, we've made mistakes. We're like, let's hire this big team and have this awesome, this thing. But then I was literally sitting around a table. I'm like, there's three people here at this table that I could probably let go and I wouldn't even feel it as far as like, it wouldn't affect our production. Yeah. And that's, I know that's sad because these are human beings and I, I'm aware of that, but it's, it's the reality as a business owner that like, am I just hiring because I want to say that I have 20 employees because that's cool, right? Yeah. Or am I doing it because it's really the best thing for the business and it's going to optimize our business. And so we, we really have to make some hard decisions and really scale back and fire people because we're like, look, we don't, we didn't need this. And it's just costing us money, it's dollars out of my pocket. That's not helping us bring in more revenue. So yeah, it's, it's tough. It's tough being a business owner. I mean, we have to sit down in front of someone and say, sorry, you're done. <laughs> they're, not, they're, they're, hard, they're hard conversations, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Guys, if you have any questions, start to drop them below. I'm going to start to get into a, a little bit more specifics in terms of um, maybe you're even your KPIs or your, your leads. Um, one question that I get a lot is about lists. And it, it varies a lot from market to market. But in your particular market, are there lists that you guys run towards or you stay away from? Um, and really, what is uh, maybe some of the ones that work for you guys out there? Yeah, great question. So consistently, here, at least here in, in Utah, the multifamily lists are always the best. As far as they're the most highly desired from, from buyers. Mm. Right? We can typically sell these multi and we're talking smaller, usually duplex to fourplex type property lists that, that we hit pretty heavily um, because, you know, let's, the second we blast out a, a duplex or something, there are so many more buyers and they're willing to pay usually retail value for these, wow. right? Because there's just so many people that have cash. They want to put, they want to put to play and they want to buy a little rental or whatever. So yeah, we've found that we heavily hit all the multifamily stuff in Utah um, that's usually performed best. And again, these are, you know, a lot of times absentee owner. I mean, same criteria you'd use for any other list, but specifically multifamily. Sure. Right. Out there, as far as the numbers on a rental, what's a good purchase price? And then what is typically the rent um, for each of those units? Utah's an anomaly, man. It, it, it doesn't make sense. Like if you're looking at it on paper, you'd be like, why would I buy there? It's, it's horrible. The return, like cap rates are, are horrendous. Like things are trading at like four, 4% 4 cap rates. It's nuts. But um, yeah, so it's hard. It's hard when someone out of state like looks at the numbers, they don't make sense. And, and even for us, that's why we're, like I said, we're buying in Ohio now. Like we're, we're moving out of state because the pricing is just getting too ridiculous. But I would say right now, like the average uh, duplex in Salt Lake, you can like, it's probably going between five and seven hundred thousand dollars. Wow, it's crazy. Yeah, and rents are probably only like twenty five hundred to four grand a month. So it's it's really not good. Like, but but what most people bank on here is appreciation. We're having a huge growth in our in our economy and our market. We're kind of turning the corner from a mid sized city to like a larger ish city a lot of people are coming in so that's kind of what's what's forcing this growth and, and the prices that can you continue going up but wow yeah it's really cool that's like the opposite of baltimore because here in baltimore like i'm north <laughs> of baltimore i'm not in the city uh but here in baltimore 
Uh, I picked up a triplex. I just sold this one, but I, I picked up a triplex for 128, had 2,700 in rent per month. Um, but the downside is the brain damage, right? So I'm yeah. sure out there you have uh, a lot more stable tenants uh, with the rents mm -hmm. being 2,500, three grand. Um, but out here, it's just how much brain damage to return on investment are you willing to risk? And there's only so much you can take yeah. at certain price points in those lower class areas. So definitely yeah. the market. Yeah. Sounds really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It's crazy. It's, it's a madhouse right now. All right. So I know um, like Jason Lewis is in your market, a good buddy of mine. Um, and I know you guys have some big players out there. Even Mike Kessler here on this call is doing really well for himself out there. Um, and I know you guys have it. I would say that your city is on a handful of other cities close to Phoenix, right? Where there's a decent amount of real estate investors doing really well for themselves, right? Baltimore, I wouldn't consider one of those. There's some good investors here, but just not like it is in other cities. Now, among you and your competitors, what do you think that you guys do differently or you might do better than them to like really differentiate, whether that's make better offers or have uh, a different amount of options available as far as owner finance, wholesale, retail? What do you guys think you do to stand out in that market? Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, I think first and foremost, like you said, the seller finance piece, I know that not everyone does that. I know there are some other investors or wholesalers here that, that do that a little bit, but we've really tried to dial that in and become very good at that where other wholesalers and, you know, other, some deals we've bought from wholesaler or the wholesalers had under contract, they couldn't perform. We come in and can offer terms and, and structure it. Right. Yeah. So there's that, but honestly, we've, we've, we've worked hard at making sure, like I said, with our relationship manager position that we are, we're not com competition. You know, people talk about this all the time. There's, it's, it's all about collaboration over competition. And we really believe that. And honestly, like we actively go out and work and network with our competition so that they bring us deals. Because we say, hey guys, look, let us do all the hard work for you. Let us dispo these deals for you. We, we're, that's what we're good at. You know, our, with our cash buyer list, how big it is, whatever. And again, there's, there's three or four big players here in Utah. But honestly, like, here's a great example. One of our, our biggest competitors, um, the other day, he just texted us. He's like, hey, um, we're, trying to, we're trying to structure this uh, seller finance deal. Can you guys help us out on this? Like, yeah, of course. Like, I mean, these are our biggest competitors. The guys are like, we're hitting the same marketing channels, right? But it, it all comes back. We go to lunch with these guys. We, we sit down with them. We're, we're, we're good friends, you know? So I think, I think when you have that, that attitude, and, and it's hard to even believe in it until you've experienced it, right? It's, it really is. It's, it's a community that if you can create that and you can make it um, mutually beneficial, deals will come. Like for example, again, our, our biggest competitors a couple of weeks ago, he sent me a deal. It was like a 10 unit apartment complex. He's like, Hey man, I know you specialize in this stuff. Do you want to just buy this? Like he wasn't even interested in it. He's just like, we've found this through our marketing. Do you want it? Like if you want to partner up on it, great. So it's just things like that. It's for us, it's been more about, we've been trying to actively create a, a culture of like, bring us deals. Cause we want to partner with you or we want to help you or, or whatever. Right. And we found that as you do that more and more, um, yeah, deals will just flow, right? That's and these really are deals you're, that you're not even marketing for. So like you look at the ROI on some of these, it's free. I mean, it's, it's infinite. Yeah. Like I didn't, I didn't have to do any work except for just be a nice guy and be a friend to these people and they'll bring me deals that they did all the hard work for. Yeah, absolutely. So let me be the first one to say, I know we have several people from Maryland or Baltimore on here that I want to be the first one that wants to collaborate with everyone in our market. <laughs> And I know it's a crazy concept, right? I, I first learned this from my buddy, Jesse, who runs Batch, uh, like a year and a half ago when I first met him. And he was like, yeah, dude, we go out and we meet, we have like game night with all of our competitors, like eight of us or nine of us at one time. And I'm like, are you serious? Like people where I'm from would not, you know, really like even think to do that. Or they would think, what's, what's the catch here? Or, you know, something like that. Yeah. So, and I know some other people on the call are probably thinking the same thing, but if they wanted to establish something like you've done in that regard, talking with your competitors, what, who are competitors, but you know, you're collaborating, um, yeah. how would you recommend they approach that? Or how would you recommend they kind of like start that up, whatever area you're in, whatever market you're in? I mean, honestly, we, we've just started hosting like a, a monthly lunch 
Like we do a monthly lunch and learn that's for newbie, newbie investors or, or experienced. We pay for it. The whole thing, like just come, we have a, a topic we talk about. Uh, so we'll do a, a luncheon like that. That's a great way for people to just start knowing you, you know, the networking. Um, then we also do just another like informal lunch with our direct co competition, like guys, big, big players that were like, Hey, just come to lunch. We just want to talk. And it's, there's no agenda. It's just like, come have lunch, talk about crazy deals you've been working on. And it's, it's funny, but again, when you're in those settings, <laughs> it, it just starts, deals just start coming to you. And it's weird because everyone has a, a different specialty, right? So again, we're, we're kind of known here locally for, we're the multifamily guys, like we buy a ton, we have the, the funding for it. We know how to structure these deals where a lot of these other big wholesalers, even like Jason Lewis, like he's like, you guys have cracked the code on like multifamily. He's like, I don't do that. I'm, I'm a killer wholesaler, but I don't really get into like buying multifamily. So if he has one of those deals, he'll bring it to us, you know? And so if you can find a niche or some, some way that you can add value to them or help them with some problem, then they'll be grateful for you. Right. And they'll want to work with you. So it's, it's again, adding some sort of value, whether that's just a networking event, or if you can be a specialist in some niche within your market, I think you'll, you'll start having people gravitate towards you and, and working with you. That's really cool stuff right there. I like that a lot. Okay. Back to leads really quick. And then I'm going to move on to, we're almost, we're coming on the back end of the show here. Um, but going back to leads, what is, I know you guys are typically doing 200 plus in revenue. What's that look like for your marketing spend? How much are you guys typically spending per month and like how many leads are you guys bringing in per month? That's a great question. I wish I knew the answer to that. Just sort um, exactly of because, if you know it, then, then yeah, yeah. Zach for sure. Because again, I'm not the guy involved in the day to day. That's Brian. Um, but yeah, uh, we're spending about between all of our marketing channels, it's roughly twenty five to thirty thousand a month. And you know, a huge portion of that's direct mail. Obviously, we're sending out a ton of mail. Um, but yeah, twenty five to thirty grand a month. Um, a leads again. I don't know exactly our our how many the quantity of leads. I should know that. Uh, I should have had that pulled up, but yeah, we're consistently closing about eight to 10 deals a month. That's amazing. Right. And really these cool. are just multi, all wholesales. And then obviously we we're cherry picking deals that we buy on our own for, for rentals, but wholesales, it's about, yeah, eight to 10 deals a month. Yeah. Really cool stuff. That's great. Especially with two acquisition guys. That, those are good numbers, right? There. Yeah. Good numbers. Okay. Awesome. Um, I am a big believer in working in my genius zone and I was just walking through someone this on a coaching call. And I just like to take my daily and weekly activities and look at it in a binary manner. What do I love and what do I not love? And then what am I great at? And what am I not great at? And I've done this exercise where I take this little note right here, right? And on each of the axes, I put great, and not great at and love and don't love. And where great and love overlap is where my genius zone is. And I try to focus a lot of my time there. I'm curious as to what you think your or what your genius zone is or what like your superpower is. Cause you guys have gone from zero to a hundred pretty quick in just a few years. Yeah. So I'm curious to find out like what your genius zone is and maybe even Brian's, if you guys know that, cause you seem to be such a good pair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, I think, so speaking for Brian, I think what he's really good at is, you know, he's the CEO. So he's very good at setting up systems and processes where um, I'm not so much, I'm more of a visionary, right? And I'm, so I work better on big ideas and big relationships and big deals. I love figuring out how to make a big deal work. Like if someone brings me this awesome, like for example, we just had this, again, this commercial building we're closing on next, next month. Um, someone brought it to us. It was kind of a short time frame. Like, hey, we got to decide if we're going to pull the trigger or not. I'm just like, I don't know where we're going to get the money, but we'll figure it out. Like, and I can do it. I'm so I'm good. At, I'm really good at raising capital. Um, I know that's a little unique for a wholesale business. Cause again, we're, we're, we're focused on buying rentals as well, but I can, I'm really good at, at the relationship side of the business, networking, raising capital and, you know, figuring out how to structure big deals. I'm really not good at the, the nitty gritty setting up systems, processes, all that kind of stuff. That's more Brian's field. Um, but that's, yeah, that's what I enjoy. That's what I love. And I love getting uncomfortable, you know, thinking like, oh, I got to raise $1.5 million by next week. How am I going to do that? I go out and do it. You know, I just, I figure out a way and I love that. It's, it's just fun to me to be able to, to put those pieces together. So 
Yeah, that's really cool. I think that's why you and I, when we've had conversations before, I think we resonate a lot because I'm of the same, I'm of a similar personality type where I like the big ideas and the big goals, but when it comes down to the implement implementation and the small details, not so much, that's not my thing. So yeah. <laughs> All right. Two more questions. Um, where do you see, what is your BHAG? Where do you see your big, hairy, audacious goal? Where do you see yourself in, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, whatever that may look like? Yeah. Yeah. So a couple things. Um, one, like I mentioned before, we do have a goal to, to own a certain amount of doors. Um, so that would be more of a passive income type of goal, right? We want to have passive income by, you know, with 5,000 doors under management. Um, then on top of that, with our wholesaling business, we want to be in, uh, you know, four or five different virtual markets as well. And we are actually now in Ohio, but we want to expand that to, you know, four or five different markets here in the next two to three years. Um, and then, like you mentioned at the beginning, we're, we're just launching a coaching program actually tomorrow. So it's a, a program that's, yeah, I mean, no different than and other programs, but it's a little more in-depth, you know, how to go beyond wholesaling, how to do wholesaling, but then to build wealth through buying rentals, building the, your portfolio, stuff like that. So honestly, like what I want to do is build that to be able to coach and help as many people as I possibly can to gain financial freedom. Like, because having done it myself, I realize, holy crap, it's not as hard as you think, or it's not as unattainable as a lot of people think it is. If, if I can do it, anyone can really, truly. Um, so that's, I, I'd say that's my goal is to, to have our, our, our portfolio being a certain size, to have our wholesaling business automated and in, in all these different markets, and then to be able to help just as many people as I possibly can to learn what we've learned and, and to accomplish what we've accomplished. Yeah, that's really good stuff right there. I want you guys to notice that when I asked him those last two questions, he just had things on the tip of his tongue for what his superpower is, what he's good at, and what he doesn't like doing. And then also for his BHAG, it's very clearly defined in his mind. You can tell that. And so it becomes a lot easier to see that and work towards it, in my opinion. So really good stuff there, Clay. All right, last question. We're obviously in a crazy market right now. You don't know what's going to happen. But what do you think is going to happen to... Um, let's just say wholesaling businesses in the next decade or so. We're seeing a lot of changes right now, but in your opinion, where are wholesalers or wholesaling businesses going to be in the next 10 years, you know, in relation to where we are now? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, obviously you can't predict the future, but I, you know, part of the reason we decided to learn more and, and start teaching our team about the, you know, seller financing and subject to is I, I think there's going to be a lot more opportunities for those types of deal structures um, where a homeowner may be upside down on a home. Like, so it wouldn't make sense in a traditional wholesale, right? There's no, there's no equity. They, there's nothing you could do to, to wholesale it, but if you could take over their payments and still cash flow, whether that's an Airbnb or putting a traditional tenant in or whatever, like I, it, to me, it's always been about, you have to be willing to adapt and get creative. So that, to me, those are the guys that are going to survive. If they're just the ones still, you know, if their business is failing and they're just like, well, just keep sending out direct mail. Let's just do the same thing we've always done. Like if it's not working, you got to adapt, right? So to me, that's the, that's the big piece is the seller financing. I think it's going to be a huge piece. And then obviously that's why we're diversifying into rentals, right? If our wholesaling business is struggling. Well, our rentals is a whole nother arm of our business that's going to hopefully thrive, right? So making sure you kind of hedge your bets and you have some other income sources coming in, you know, and, and again, we're investing in some software uh, stuff that we're going to have coming up too. So it's just, it's looking at all these different options, uh, all within real estate, but how can we, how can we diversify our income streams to keep us afloat if something were to go down? Yeah. So That's again, I don't know what'll happen, but if it does, I, I, I feel like we'll be, we'll be set up in a way that will survive, right? And we'll adapt. Yeah, that's amazing right there. I, I've talked to several people in many different circles. And I think there's a pretty, among some of the smarter people I know, I, I think there's a pretty broad consensus that owner finance or creative finance or terms deals are going to be a very useful skill over the coming years. And mm -hmm. so um, I'm encouraged to learn more every time I talk with someone like you and you guys have, have certainly started to become an authority in the space now. Um, it's something we're start starting to move into as well, because I think it's going to be a very useful skill uh, in the coming years. So 
super smart of you there. All right, give yourself a plug. Where can everyone find you, follow you? Um, where do you want everyone to go after the episode to, to learn more about you guys, your business, perhaps your coaching? Yeah, um, honestly, like everything I do is on social media. So just at Clay Rockwood, um, just my personal page there. I, I post updates about our coaching stuff. Like it's so new. We don't even have a website set up. We're just in the beta program launch right now. But um, but yeah, uh, beyond wholesaling, you know, I'll, I'll be posting more about it once we release it to the public. But um, yeah, I, I just, I post fun stuff about deals we're doing, how we've structured stuff. So if people want to reach out and you know, contact me, DM me, whatever, I'm, I'm an open book. I love sharing what we, what I know, what we do, how we structure deals. So if you have questions, you know, obviously feel free to reach out to me. And honestly, Josh, like you're a rock star, man. I, I should be the one reaching out to you and asking questions because I feel like you are the, you are the expert in your space. So I, I honestly appreciate you having me on here. I feel like I should be the one asking you questions. Dude, I appreciate that very much. I, you know, it's funny, but I love asking questions. I don't know why it comes natural to me. My wife and I, when we first met, she was like, why do you ask so many goddamn questions? It's like really annoying. And I'm like, I, I never knew that I asked more questions than the average person, but I guess I do. I don't know. Yeah. I have fun doing it. So, anyway, man, Good, man, we are past our time. Dude, I really appreciate you. I really enjoyed this conversation. I know that the people here have gotten a lot out of it. Um, super smart dude. And I'm looking forward to watching your growth. Um, and I'm already looking forward to our next conversation. So thank you so much yeah. for your time today, my friend. Um, Likewise. I hope you have a great time on the rest of your vacation. Um, guys, I hope you got some value out of this today. And if you did, please go invite some of your friends to the group. Um, and until next time, I look forward to seeing you guys again. Take care. Clay, th thank, th thank you, buddy. Take care. Talk soon. Yeah. See ya. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.